Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I wanted to remind you of our Road to a Thousand Subscribers giveaway that we have going on our YouTube channel. If you subscribe and have a public profile, you'll be entered to win a free RX Smart Gear original jump rope. You'll get to pick the pattern of the handles, the color and weight of the cable, and you'll be getting one of the best selling, best performing jump ropes out there. Every time we hit a new century mark with the number of subscribers to our channel, we'll randomly select a new winner. And our friend Dave Newman is gonna throw in a little something extra for each winner. So a special thanks to our sponsor, RX Smart Gear, to Dave Newman for being such a great partner and to you for being a loyal listener. Good luck, and I hope you are our next winner. We are so excited to now have Mobility Movement as a partner. Their holistic approach to recovery is second to none. This is not just a program that helps with your flexibility and mobility. It also assists with stress release and sleep, two key factors in overall recovery. The website gives you a plan for, for each week, saves your favorites, gives you sleep protocols, has a specific protocol for your first week joining, and then there are these new things called open snacks, which are super cool. Here you are given quick warm-ups and cool-down protocols for the open wads, featuring elite athletes Allison Scuds and Saxon Panchik. And who doesn't need recovery after those open workouts? The extensive library available to you is both vast and diverse. If you want to try Mobility Movement, go to mobilitymovement.com. That is mobilitymnt.com. And make sure you use our code CLYDESDALE20, all caps, to get 20% off your first six months. That's mobilitymovement.com, mobilitymnt.com. Use code Clydesdale20 to get 20% off your first six months. I've been using this since the first of the year and I am sleeping better than I have in so many years. And with all the back issues I've had over the last five years, this has given me so much relief and I'm able to work out four to five times a week without any pain at all. So go to mobilitymovement.com, that's mobilitymnt.com, and use Clydesdale 20 to get 20% off your first six-month subscription. Hey everybody, welcome to the Clydesdale Fitness and Friends. My name is Scott Schweitzer. I am the Clydesdale. I am your host. We love to do fitness, and this is my friend. Uh, this is my friend Cooper Marsh. I've got to know him a little bit more over the last few weeks, and we're going to get to know him a lot more today as we sit down with him for a nice long form podcast. So, Cooper, how you doing? Doing great. Just, you know, trying to keep my head above water, as as is everybody else, right? Yeah. So you're heading into the open. Um, is this a busy time for you traditionally? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just a busy time. Honestly, man, like I feel like I say, yeah, it's a busy time. It's just always a busy time. Um, I'd say it's more of an exciting time, right? Like it's, it's, you know, people are fired up, big goals, season ahead. Um, you know, it just kind of feels like, like we're almost like in, it's like entering holiday season. It's not exactly Christmas Eve. Cause I would say that would be more like the CrossFit games, but we're entering Halloween time. Yeah, there you go. So, so you have two athletes doing the first open announcement going yep. head to head against each other. What does that do for your psyche and what involvement do you have during that, that period? Uh, yeah. So Bethany and Danielle are doing it. Um, I mean, just, just kind of making sure that it worked for them. They, they uh, you know, HQ reached out to us um, a little late in the game per se. Right. Which, um, you know, it's, there's been some, you know, uh, it's been a tumultuous time for them. So things are a little bit up in the air and, uh, it was kind of nice though, because they reached out just to be asked is, is really nice. Um, but it was one of those things where Bethany and Danielle are in a really good rhythm right now in Vegas with their coach, Justin. Um, and so they didn't really want to be disturbed by that. So we tried to get them to come to Vegas, but, uh, you know, they weren't able to just because of the turn time was so, so quick. And, um, it was actually quite nice because as soon as I emailed Justin Berg to try to like push back and get them to come to Vegas, he gave me a call within 90 seconds of me sending that email. Um, and, you know, spoke, you know, talked through it was like, look, we'll do anything we can to get them there uh, and make it as comfortable for them as possible. And so for me, it's just like, I'm just kind of handling some of their asks and requests to make sure that doesn't kind of disrupt their training routine too much. Um, and, and just to make sure that they're like, you know, the ladies are taken care of and uh, you know, JB and his team from uh, HQ were, were super, super fun to work with on that. And uh, you know, we're stoked to get up there next week and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go up with them and, just be bag boy, you know, yeah. anything they need slash drive the car around. So, 
Yeah, fun. that was kind of one of my questions because, you know, when I was at Wadapalooza, I saw you walking with some of your athletes as I was trying to find my credentials um, in a way to get into the venue. Uh, you were walking with your athletes. What What is your general job description at events? I mean, I, I literally, I, I make the joke all the time that I'm just a glorified babysitter. Um, you know, and it's really like, I just, I'm the bag boy, man. Like I just, any, anything, literally anything and everything I can do to make their lives easier when they compete so that they can focus on the task at hand is what I'll do. So, um, you know, like garbage disposal, I guess would be like a good, you know, description for me. Um, so, I mean, obviously I'm walking around, I'm talking to, you know, brands and developing those relationships for potential partnerships, um, or maybe just kind of, uh, reconnecting with some of the brands that already support our athletes. Um, but you know, sometimes I've got to make sure, you know, Danielle's getting to her meet and greet, right. Or, you know, Amanda can get to her next meet and greet. So I have to be the jerk to like stop the line and be like, catch us at the next booth or whatever, you know? Um, but then like, you know, Dallin rolls his ankle. I was like, um, maybe I have to carry this dude. And then I didn't have to thankfully, cause I have medical. I don't know why I would but I thought for a second I might have to carry him. I was like, this is going to be tough. Good thing I'm, I trained. Um, so yeah, like, you know, I get the PT there and make sure that the PT is seeing everybody and, um, you know, if they need food or supplements or anything from a sponsor, or, you know, if I need to tell a sponsor that, Hey, we're not doing an autograph session because they compete in two hours. Like, no, you know, like anything I can to take as much off their plate as possible. Do you deal with the scheduling, like getting them, two places on the right time or is that their coach's responsibility i mean at the end of the day they're all adults right like you know they they manage their lives without me from day to day so they can they they know what time they should be places and they'll get there i mean if i need to like pick somebody up and help them actually get to a place and by all means for sure but um you know they, their coaches are on top of that in terms of like hey we're getting corralled at 12 30 you need to be in the warm-up area by 11 45 to warm up for however long and discuss the workout and then you're good to go. So um, they're pretty, pretty good about that. So you had a unique situation in Wadapalooza where rad was launching their product kind of at that venue. Um, yep. It was, they hadn't even been on sale to the public yet. Website wasn't even fully developed. Danielle is announced that weekend as kind of their first sponsored athlete did that put extra pressure because of that sponsor or is it just like any other sponsor? Um, I mean, Benji, um, Benjamin, the, the owner and CEO of rad, like he's the easiest dude ever to work with. Um, so no, there was no pressure that it was just fun. Like I, so I mean, do you want me to like back this up? Do you want me to like talk about rad from the, from the jump type deal? Sure. Let's, let's see. And then we can see the behind the scenes. All right. All right. We'll get into it more. Um, well, first, is this podcast video? Yeah. Sick. So, you know, if you guys didn't get your opportunity, you know, you need to make sure that you check out the, uh, the new sand colorway. They're really nice. That's going to love me for this. They're fresh. Um, but no, I so gotta, I got to say they are sick looking shoes. Like I was walking with Dex Dude, Hopkins. They're one of my favorite training shoes. I really like the Metcons. I really like the Nano X ones. Um, and then I'm a big fan of these, especially just like just some of the small details, like just the ridge line on here. When you do like a rope climb, they lock in like crazy hard. Um, and then the suede is just pretty fresh, man. But they're just super comfortable. They're just like a really well made shoe. And I feel like uh, they're punching above their weight class right now, right? Because they're so small as a team, yet they created such an incredible shoe on their first go. It's, it's kind of nuts. Well, I'm, I'm 52 years old, right? Yeah. And so when I first saw the, the color wave with the white and the, and the yellow green yep. color, um, that look to me reminded me of a mid era Jordan. Oh, okay. Right. Not, not the early Jordans, not the air force ones, but like that mid range, um, one and, Man, everybody I talked to were like, those are sick shoes. And everybody yeah. I've talked to that's worn them, loves them. I got to get my hands on a pair. 100%. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I'll put you in touch with Benjamin. He can take care of you. Um, oh. But yeah, so so Rad reached out, right? They, they um, obviously Danielle was with another company and, you know, you have to kind of honor honor the timeline of that that piece, right? So it was, it was one of those things where um, 
once the kind of the floodgates opened, a bunch of brands wanted to come and work with Danielle and rad came into the picture. Uh, and I was like, you know, who is this dude? I remember I getting on a call with him and him showing me the, you know, the shoe and I'm like, Oh wow. You like actually created a shoe. Um, learned more about him. Next thing you know, you know, Benjamin flew all the way over to the U S to be able to meet up with myself and Danielle and, you know, really give it a, a good pitch and, just just the way he carries himself and, and the brand itself and what they were offering and the fact that, you know, they're so new, it's a blank slate really, right? But they just, the overwhelming message that they want is um, they want Danielle to be who Danielle is, right? That's it. They just want to be a platform to help that. And, uh, you know, it it's just like a, it's like a huge testament to kind of like who Benjamin is to, to be able to kind of trust her uh, and her natural instinct, right. With his, with his baby and this brand and, um, just who they are as a brand, right. Rad and, and how they're kind of like, uh, just like no F's given, like they are who they are is the same exact thing as Danielle. So it was like a perfect marriage. Um, and it was one of those things where, you know, Danielle was just like, yep, this is, this is absolutely worth the risk to leave an established brand for, for this one. Um, because this is who I am. And so, it was, it was super exciting. And, uh, you know, then, then when Wadapalooza came around, we were all, we were all stoked that they're going to be there. Um, but Benjamin was a little hesitant because he wanted to make sure that, you know, they were doing the announcement exactly how they wanted to do it. Um, but we were like, all right, cool. We should, we should at least get photos here while, while we're in Miami. Right. Uh, you have Wynwood, which is, you know, the incredible art, art district. And, you know, we got the shoes, we got Danielle, like we've got awesome photographers literally roaming around Waterpolis. So let's just snag one. So we used Justin, um, who's, who's a stud. And we went out and we went out early morning uh, in Wynwood for a golden hour and we're just taking photos and they're just turning out so sick. And the, and the vibes were really high. It's, it, you know, it feels like you're like, we were out like surfing. It was like one of those like early morning, like everybody's just buzzing. And um, then we're sitting there at breakfast and I'm like, Benjamin, should we just launch Danielle here? You know? And he's like, um, I kind of want to, but he's like, I'm just, I don't want to, you know, you only get one shot at it. And I'm like, well, are we potentially overthinking this? Um, and he's like, maybe he's like, let's put it out to a table vote. And so like, you know, we, we asked the table of like the random people that we were with, right. Photographer, some other agents with lab, uh, Danielle. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. Like, why not, man? Like let's strike while the iron's hot. So we were like, screw it, let's do it. Um, went over really well, had a great, you know, photo shoot, uh, great meet and greet at the booth. You know, I thought Danielle's caption was epic for her to, for her to like announce the partnership. And I think it just kind of put an immediate stamp on the company, like, yo, they came to play. Um, and yeah, and I mean, Benjamin had originally told me like there was no, he was either launching with Danielle as an athlete or he was launching with no athletes. So it was, I asked him who else he was interested in. He sent me a deck and it was just literally eight different photos of Danielle. So I was like, okay, this guy is not playing around. It's Danielle or no one. So, um, yeah, it was, it just, it was really cool, man. And, and just seeing like, they keep selling out. Like they just did drop two yesterday, sold out. Like, and yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm proud of Benjamin. He's busting his ass and I'm, I'm proud of Danielle for going with her gut and going with her heart and, and, and choosing something a little bit, a road less traveled. Yeah. And I, did you know the gold mine you had in Danielle when you signed her? Like she is, has become so popular so fast. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I would could say I would, I knew, I mean, like, I think I have a judge of a of good character and a good athlete, right? Like I feel like people I surround myself with are like outstanding human beings and I'm just lucky to be near them. Um, and so that's like true of anyone on our roster. It's just the fact, like, it's funny, Jason, uh, my partner in the agency and the one who started lab, we were sitting at, you know, the CrossFit games in 2019 and they were making the cuts. Right. So and when they cut to 20, everybody got a bathing suit, but then when they cut to 10 is when they actually used it. Um, and we were sitting on the PT table with our guy, Ryan Lunny and, you know, Danielle walks by and she's like, super tan like danielle gets like really tan and she's built you know like a brick shit house like she is like a thoroughbred as thoroughbreds come right and she walks by and i look at jason i'm like who is that and he's like no idea and i was like that chick could win the crossfit games um 
and so then, you know, she unfortunately got cut. She was 11th, right? She should have been 10th because somebody popped. Um, but might have been better for me because she flew under the radar and didn't get any exposure. And then I reached out to her and was like, yo, you need representation. I think you could be incredible. Um, and she was just typical Danielle, like, what? No way. Like, I'm like, yeah, no, seriously. And then, you know, we held on for a few years and, and did some things to make ends meet. But um, at this year's past games, we were really feeling like it would be like a coming out party for her. And then it was. And then, you know, all of the COVID stuff she had to deal with, um, the spotlight really got put on her. And it was sad because it was like kind of at the, at the, um, you know, setback of Bethany and Carrie. But Danielle got so much coverage on that uh that it definitely helped her brand and allowed her to kind of showcase some of that grit and that you know uh no f's given attitude and then you know people latch onto that man they love real and she is real and as raw as they come and so after this games i was like yeah you're gonna be a star so it's pretty cool yeah i think the fun thing for me is when we had danielle on the show um i hypothetically asked her if her current shoe company at that time came to her and said hey we want you to design a color wave or an apparel line. What color wave would you pick? And, and now that I talked to her a couple of weeks ago, that, that is a possibility for her now. 100%. And, uh, and that's what was really cool. Kind of seeing that come full circle. Yeah. I mean, they're already working on stuff, man. Like there's some, there's some great stuff coming down the pipeline. I cannot wait for them to share it with you guys. Cause it's going to be very cool. Yeah, you've got me completely off script, but that's the way I like it. Yeah. So um, you mentioned your your stable of, of just great people. And that's one one note I have down here. And that is that of all the people that I've met in CrossFit, like your stable are the people that I have like good relationships with because they're just great people. Um, you, I am assuming that that is a very integral part when you are looking at who you're going to sign. Yes. hundred percent. Like I don't, we don't work with, uh, jerks. We just don't, it's just not who we are. It's never who we're going to be. Um, and I'm not, that's not to say that other athletes are jerks. I just, there are people out there, right. Who, who are, you know, major athletes in the space who might not be as friendly or willing to go out of their way to do something, um, you know, for a fan or et cetera. Right. And all of our athletes put their pant leg on one leg at a time, just like the rest of us. They understand that they're just really good at CrossFit. Right. But they have their own things that they have to, you know, that they need help with or struggle with, or, you know, stresses, anxieties, pressure, whatever they, you know, we all have it. Um, but it doesn't matter. They, they handle them with a lot of grace and then they go out there and they perform and then they perform off the floor as well. Right. And they're, they're just incredible people like behind your head, right. Bulldog and Crocs, Bethany Shepard, like uh, Bethany is like the most friendly giving person ever. Like I remember being down in Argentina with her South America and being between events. And I'm like, she was like, Hey, we should go out and like say what's up to the fans. And I'm like, you, you want to do that in between events? Like you don't want to chill. And she's like, no, like I love seeing them. It, it makes me, you know, it gives me like a buzz of energy and you know, it, without them, I can't do anything. And it's like, sweet, let's do it. You know, like, and, and, and Danielle is the same way. And like, you know, Amanda was really excited to fly down to Waterpalooza and make time to do that stuff. Right. Like Emma Carey traveled in to be able to make time for that stuff. Um, Fee Sagafi, even while she's competing was doing that stuff. Like, you know, it's like, they all do it, man. And it's like, it made my job so easy because I show up to a brand. They're just like, it's like their family or friends because they love the athletes so much and love working with them because they're just such good people that it's like, I'm not coming in to like put out fires. We're just coming in to have fun and party and do our thing. You know? Yeah. Just yeah. that's an Emma Carey right there. Is that an old school EC, right? Oh, I so can that, see her. That's the competition yeah. her and her family would hold. Uh, okay in their hometown. Um, when I had her on like two years ago, before anybody knew who she was to, as a thank you, they sent me that. And oh I said, God. I'd only take it if she signed it. Dude, see like salt of the earth people, man. Like it's, it's unbelievable how nice that family is like, you know, and, and I know that family because of Dallin Pepper and his family. Right. Yeah. And like, I got put onto Dallin because of Harry Anderson from ESC audio, him and I have a really good relationship. He's a super nice dude. Bust his tail. Um, and he was like, yo, you need to work with Dallin. Like I'm working with him, but I know that he's, he could do more. And, uh, like he was working with him in terms of like a, as a, as a sponsor, he's like, but I think he's going to, you know, pop here soon and he needs guidance. So let me put you in touch. I'm like, all right, cool. 
we had a great conversation. We started working together. Like I love Dallin. His family's incredible. Um, they'll do anything for you. And then Dallin was like, yo, Emma Carey, you need to work with her. I told her and like, she's, her family's unbelievable. Um, you know, had a call with them. And by the end of the call, they're like, yeah, no, we're, we're ready to go. And I was like, Oh, usually you guys think about this for a second. They're like, Nope. Dallin said, you're good. We're good. And I was like, sounds good. Welcome to the family. Um, so it's just like, that's just kind of how it's, how it's been. Like, uh, so it's, it's just like, so tight knit. It's like, I'm gonna start crying if I keep thinking about it. Cause I love yeah, it. So, yeah. much. <laughs> so it's funny because, um, I've been, I've been around the sport since 2014. I was a volunteer. I've done security. I've been a judge, all those things. So I've had a glimpse behind the scenes of athletes persona in front of people and behind the scenes when they don't have to be that person. Your athletes are always the same behind the scenes as they are in front of people. Oh yeah. That's, I mean, a hundred percent. I've seen it. I've seen what you're talking about. And that's, and that's what I'm saying, man. It's like behind closed doors. Who are you actually? Cause like, you know, Danielle might, might cuss on the floor and she might cuss you out behind closed doors too. Right. But then she's also going to like 10 minutes later when she cools off, she's going to be like, all right, let's go get a beer. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's who she is. Uh, you know, Emma Carey is going to be sweet as I'll get out on the floor. She's going to be sweet as I'll get out off the floor. Right. Like they are who they are. Um, and it's, it's the coolest thing ever. But at the end of the day, they are all like baseline, incredible human beings. Yeah. So. And so the last person I want to ask you about is um, Annika was on, Annika Greer was on Talking Elite Fitness um, just what, a week ago, maybe? Yep. And on that broadcast, she said that you signed her before anybody knew who she was. Yeah. So it is that what you're looking to do is find people as they're under the radar I mean, um, and getting to know them or are you okay with them going big and then trying to sign them? Either or, um, I mean the first, first, I just want to make sure that it's clear that, you know, we signed her to the lab family, but she, Annika is incredible, but she also does a lot of work with, um, with Deb Graff, who's, who's part of the lab family. And so, uh, you know, I cannot take all credit for that at all, but yeah, I did she did find, mention you and Deb yeah, good. Um, on the podcast, just, just making sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we, it's, it's a little bit of both. Like it's funny, man. Like I remember, I remember, um, and I don't know how, how like early, like Daniel Robbins does it. Um, but like, I remember seeing Medeiros when he was at Granite games and he took, third place or something like just missed the games. Um, and I reached out to him and we were like, yeah, let's connect. And then we never connected. And then down the line, I, both agencies were recruiting him and he went with loud and live and Daniel's absolutely crushed with him. And it's pretty awesome to see, but it's just funny. Cause it's like, Oh, wow. I, I read that one really well, you know, um, before anybody really knew who he was. And then, um, you know, then he went and won filthy one fifty, and that's like, quote unquote, like, now you're bigger, right? Because people recognize like, oh, you're a games athlete. Um, and so then there was competition in that. So I guess in reality, I'd like to probably find people before they're super big. So then I'm the only one recruiting them. That makes my life easier. But um, but it goes both ways, you know, like I've signed people um, when they're already like up there, you know, like Carrie Pierce uh, started working with me when she was already a perennial games athlete. So um, and now that she's retired, she's leaned fully into power abs, but you know, we had a good run together of like four or five years. So, yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask you about an athlete like Colleen Fosh. Yep. Right. Crossfitter does very well. And then all of a sudden flips to another sport. And then in that other sport, I think her, like it from the outside in, it looked like her endorsement deals and sponsorships actually went up because of the exposure she had as a CrossFitter moving to bobsled. Now I know she's not doing that anymore, but at, in that moment, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, I'm just supportive of whatever it is the athlete wants to do. Colleen's a total badass. She's such a nice person. She actually lives in Arizona. So whenever we like meet up, it's not a phone call. It's like, Hey, just come into the office. Um, she's just, she's, She's just a stud. Yeah. She went, I mean, she went there, right. She went and was pursuing that. And I mean, I was like really hopeful that she was going to go to the Olympics. Then obviously it was heartbreaking when she tore ACL. Cause she was really making solid progress there. 
Um, in terms of endorsement deals, it's like she still has that huge platform she worked for while she was doing CrossFit and still has a CrossFit audience. So she can, we were still able to utilize that um, with some of those CrossFit brands, but then, you know, some more non-traditional, like non-endemic to CrossFit brands came, came knocking and we were able to do some stuff there too, which was fun. Um, but right now we're in this, a little bit of a transition period for her because she's starting to come back. She's able to start squatting again with the barbell. And she has always been super into weightlifting. She's incredibly gifted at it. Um, but never in CrossFit, it was always like she had to tone it down, you know? Uh, and so now she's thinking like, you know what, maybe I just want to not tone it down. I just want to see what I can do here. Um, so, you know, she's, she's healing the knee and we'll see how the barbell starts to feel, but who knows, man, maybe Colleen will come to a, you know, a weightlifting event near you and, and tear it up and we'll, we'll continue to link her up with good brands there. But yeah, she also, she also works full time as like a data analyst. So people don't even realize that. So yeah, she's awesome. But yeah, the, uh, the endorsement deals definitely switched a little bit. Um, but in terms of like bobsledding itself, um, there wasn't really like bobsled brands coming around. Cause I don't really think there's many of those. Um, yeah. but it, it wasn't too much of a switch up. Like it was when one of the first athletes I ever worked with, um, Cynthia Gautier, she's a monster truck driver. Uh, and she's a, you know, obviously in a male dominated industry, right. Motorsports. Uh, but she's a female and she's from Canada and she can backflip a monster truck. She's insane. That was the first athlete I worked with and I knew CrossFit. I didn't know that. So I'm, I'm out here, you know, the first deal I ever did was with Lincoln electric, a welding company, um, huge welding company. Right. But like, I was like, I don't know anything about welding. I don't know anything about motorsports, you know, and I was just chipping away, trying to do what I could for, for Cynthia learning about the industry while trying to make deals happen. Um, so, you know, when I moved into CrossFit with Bethany, it was, it was a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, so I have a couple more questions about this and then we're going to get into your history. Um, the next thing is a typical day when you're not at events, right? You're in the office. Is it really building relationships with sponsors or are there other things that, that an agent has to do, um, with their clients? So, a typical day, like, yes, I'm either on phone calls with current or prospective partnerships. Um, I'm probably helping brands like make sure that they're at the, app, you know, getting their stuff in a timely manner, make, make sure they're doing their posts. Maybe they have questionnaires they need to answer for a, for a media piece, scheduling, things like that. Um, but then I'm also, you know, like you've got to invoice, right? You've got to make sure that, you know, companies paid on time. You've got to uh, you know, obviously a lot of emailing, but then I'll, you know, with lab, we also help run athlete brands. So, you know, my day-to-day -day is also helping with good dudes coffee for Josh Bridges or Josh's website, or making sure that new merch is being created for him to sell, or, you know, hopping on a call with, uh, Maddie Rogers and, you know, Nicole and Melissa and Jessica, the team around them, her for Vicaya, um, and, you know, making sure email campaigns go out and SMS texts. And then, going back to the warehouse. And if, you know, our guys in to fulfill things, great. If he's not, then I need to go make sure all those packages get out. So sometimes I spend a lot of day, like of my day on a Saturday in here, it's like shipping out 300 orders or something. <laughs> so it can totally vary, man. Um, last week was waste management open and Scott Stallings, which is an athlete that I work with, uh, was out here playing. So I was on the course seven days in a row, just walking the course with him supporting uh, but also networking a little bit and, you know, doing meetings and, and calls in between. So it can totally change day to day, but for the most part, I'm just sitting here, you know, brainstorming and, and tracking down how it is that I can grow these athletes brands and, and get them compensated. So my next question is when you're working with an athlete, do you help them with their career decisions? Like not necessarily sponsorships and partnerships, but like a, a new coach or, um, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. If the athlete, if the athlete wants my input, then absolutely. Um, like for example, you know, Danielle and Bethany didn't really have coaches. Uh, so after we did the thing where Danielle, Bethany and Carrie all worked out in California and Kotler came out, they saw how Kotler was with, uh, Carrie and like how like loving he is. Um, and they were like, wait a minute, that could be really good for my game. So, you know, I kind of, gently pushed them, uh, towards Kotler and, you know, it, was, it had to work for him as well, but it did. And, um, 
you know, that's kind of how they ended up with underdogs. Um, so that's been really cool, but yeah, I, I mean, in terms of career decisions, absolutely. I, I, if, if they want to have my opinion, I will offer it. But other than that, you know, it's, it's up to them. Yeah. As a fan, I'm, I'm thankful you gently nudge them to underdogs. One of my favorite, um, things I got to do last year was hang out at West coast classic and watch the three of them completely dominate the field. That was sick. That was, it was so good. That's why I was just, still disappointing that it didn't happen at the games. <laughs> yeah. 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 But so my last agent question, and then we're going to kind of get into your background is, you know, I've seen where like in major league baseball and football, the agent has to be certified. Is that something that has to happen with a CrossFit athlete or a power lifter or an Olympic lifter? No, it does not. Um, but that being said, I mean, there actually has been talks that we've had with some of the other like agents that manage some of the uh, higher end athletes in the space about potentially creating a certification around that um, just because it makes our jobs easier when everybody's like on the same page and, you know, you don't have somebody like detracting from what it is you're trying to do or, or putting, you know, a bad taste in a company's mouth about agents. So I think we want to do something like that. Um, but for me, you know, Jason, my mentor and partner, Jason's a certified baseball agent, right? He was a pro baseball player and he still represents, um, some baseball athletes that we work with on the marketing side. And then he also does their clubhouse deals. Um, you know, my number one thing is like, you need to, if you want to enter this space, you need to get under somebody like that for a couple of years um, and, and learn because other than that, you're going to come in and, you know, you don't want to make an ass of yourself. Um, and I'm all for failing and learning, right. And like failing upwards, but, you know, save yourself a lot of, mistakes uh by learning from somebody who's done that before you so i feel like i am certified because before i was full-time with this you know i was under jason's wing for two years just not allowed to say anything and just listen you know and 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 learn and then he would ask me questions and like test me and all this stuff so um you know it's kind of similar like robin daniel robbins did under o'keefe right um so super super important i think and that's why i have a few people that are under me under lab like and we have, you know, weekly team calls where we go through certain scenarios, situations, um, things that I'm running into, things they're running into, questions, thoughts, concerns, whatever, so that we can make sure that they're, you know, learning and, and growing. Yeah, I think that's important in all industries, right? Um, like I started this podcast two and a half years ago, and I knew nothing walking in. I wasted so much money and so much time trying to build this thing if I just would have had a mentor that could show me. And that's what I'm trying to do now with my podcast network is mentor others so they don't make the same mistakes I did. 100%. And it's just like, it's high tides rise all ships, man. Like, you know, you're going to be better for it and they're going to be better for it. And, it's, you know, and then the content coming out in this space is going to get even better, right? Right. So it'll be very cool. And I, that, I mean, I, I kudos to you, man. That's freaking awesome. So now let's talk about you. And so it's funny when I, when I have people on and I do the research, sometimes I'm just shocked at what I find. And with you, your background is insane. It not at all what I expected. So it, first of all, it looked like when you were a kid and up through college, you spun a wheel of sports and said, okay, I'll try that one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did a lot of different things for sure. I like to think that I'm really good at all, a lot of sports, which maybe not top end at any of them maybe skiing yeah yeah so i, I saw you were a ski instructor you, you played tennis rugby lacrosse soccer yeah and that's not even like your traditional sports like baseball so football or... i uh i grew up playing trap sorry it cut out there for a second say that again yeah, yeah and that's not even the traditional sports like football baseball and and the like so I never, I never really did the traditional like football baseball. I played baseball one year, but yeah. So, you know, I, I, I grew up playing soccer. My sister played soccer. So that was a no brainer. Um, my dad was really into it and you know, my mom probably just wanted me to get energy out. So yeah, I, I played soccer, I played travel soccer. And then, you know, I did that growing up and, and, and then played, you know, like went through varsity and, and played varsity like early on in high school, like in ninth grade, right. Or whatever, eighth grade. Um, cause we were at a regional school. So you had middle school attached to it. Um, and then I played lacrosse from fourth grade, fifth grade. Like that's when I started. 
And then the one year I played baseball was sixth grade because I didn't think that there was a lacrosse team because it was like a county team because I lived out in the boondocks of Western Massachusetts. Um, and so I didn't think that there was a team. So I played baseball. I remember the first time I pitched, I struck the first kid out and then I just got shelled, like just annihilated. And I was like, God, I do not like this game. It was, it was too slow for me. Um, even though I know like professional baseball is actually very fast and intense and there's a lot of like, it's like a lot of chess out there, but at that level, it's just not what I was going to do. So kept playing lacrosse, played that through high school. Um, probably could have played that in college at like a low end level, but didn't really care to, um, played junior college soccer for two years, uh, which was awesome. And I'd play against some incredibly good talent, but you know, I was just, that's, that is where I learned that like, you know, hard work, uh, you know, defeats talent, um, when talent fails to work hard. Right. So, um, like that, that was, I wanted to make that team. I wasn't recruited, even though it was junior college, they were recruiting for it. Um, and so I had to walk onto that program and, and earn my spot. And then I was a starter the second year. And then I, and then I went out to UMass and I didn't play soccer there, but that was where I, I really kind of learned to love to work hard, um, was during that. And, and then all, you know, simultaneously, I also, uh, you know, I skied and competed in freestyle skiing and slope style, which like, if you don't know what that is, watch the Olympics, they're just, just at it. So I had some shop sponsorships for that. And, uh, a couple of the kids that I grew up with, like, um, like Devin Logan, she was just over and competing in her third Olympics, I grew up with Devin skiing with her. Um, you know, and, and I know I've skied with some of the kids, like the kid who took silver in the slope style, uh, Nick Gepper, I've skied laps with him and, you know, and buddies with one of his really good buddies. And yeah, it's a small world, but like, I grew up with a bunch of kids that went to the Olympics, X games, et cetera. So they were, they were very good at skiing. Um, so yeah, did a lot of that stuff, man. And then, yeah, you know, dabbled around in tennis and got into CrossFit when I was like a junior in college. And that's kind of what's kept me entertained ever since. So you went to UMass and then you did, you studied abroad. I did. Yeah. At, at Oxford. I did. Yes. It was cool. Yeah. Like that's amazing to me <laughs> uh, as a business major. And then to see that you have you, your bachelor's was in economics. Yep. Um, which uh, economics was one of my favorite classes. Um, it makes sense. That's why, <laughs> you know, and, just statistics, statistics make sense. It's common sense math. Correct. Yeah. Accounting is stupid. My girlfriend would hate me, but yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what was it like spending a, a, a semester abroad in England? Well, I mean, the real quick backstory of that, which is hilarious, is when I when I transferred from Holyoke Community College to UMass, my GPA reset, so I had a four point oh, right? You start off. And I'm a, I'm a junior at that point. So I, ha I had it figured out. I knew how college worked. I wasn't like bunking classes, right? I was showing up on time and it's my money. I'm going to make this work. But I then had to choose uh, a major. So I chose economics. So it was just economics straight for two years, right? So I had to start with the freshman level classes as a junior, which were super easy. And so I aced them all. And so I pretty much, I go into the study of, uh, abroad affairs office and I talk to the guy. And I'm like, yeah, man, I think I want to, I want to try to go to a school that would make my resume look better. Like I'd, I'd like to go to Oxford and he's a British student. He's like, Oh really? I went to Oxford as an undergrad. And he's like, and I used to run the program between university of Georgia and Keeble college at Oxford. And I was like, Oh no shit. And he's like, what's your GPA? And I was like uh, a 3.9. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. Here, just fill this out. And he gave me a one page sheet. That was my address and my t-shirt size. And he was like, you're going to Oxford. And I was like, okay. And so off I went. So I, I was at Keeble College, which is one of like the, there's like 26 or 36 uh, colleges within the university. And each one's like its own thing, right? Like it's got its own student body, staff, library, dining hall. Like you, you see the photos of Oxford, right? It's like these beautiful courtyards. Cause that's like, you open the gate and you walk in and like, that's one college. Right. Um, and so like the ones that you traditionally see, right. Are like, new college right which was used in harry potter um or like you know saint catherine's or whatever Balliol. like there's these incredible you know colleges christ church right and it's like yeah man you just i'm riding my bike i played lacrosse over there for the university um during that and you walk in as an american you're a stud because they weren't that versed in the game at that point um now they're a lot better but you know i'm riding my bike to 
to practice and I'm like riding next to a building that was, you know, the signs like, Oh, this was created in 1532. And I'm like, Jesus, that's 240 years older than our country. Like yeah. what? You know, I'm like, you're, you're riding like, Oh, that's where, um, you know, like what's his face. Uh, the dude who wrote Narnia. Um, yeah. Um, e- e- no, C.S. No. Lewis or whatever. C.S. Lewis. That's it. Yeah. Like, Oh, that was his dorm room. Like that's his window. You know, you're just like, it's just like mind blowing, like the beauty and the, and the breadth and the depth of like the history there is just out of this world, man. Like, and it's, it's just, it's so sick. Like Oxford is one of the coolest places. I tell people they should absolutely go because it's worth walking around, checking out. Um, it was one of the most fun times. I mean, I remember the first class I took, it was with this guy, Dr. Ian Archer. I started to fall asleep during class. because I was just like tired or something like that. He just, he just balled up the paper and just slammed me on the top of the head and told me to wake up. And I was like, my apologies. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it's like the way that they teach, they, they're called tutorials, right? So it's like, it's one on four, one hour a week, or it's one on three, one on two, one on one, but like never more than four. So you are with like the world renowned expert. It'd be similar to being like, Oh, you're, you like to take CrossFit classes. Cool. Well, you're going to sit here and, you know, Matt Fraser or, you know, Rich Froning is going to sit here and, or, or Dave Castro, right. He's going to like grill you right now about all things CrossFit. Um, it's, it's learning from the utmost experts, right? Like I, I walked in and doc, Dr. George Bitsakakis, this Greek guy, he was like, Hey, I took the liberty of printing your books out for you. I wrote it and just handed it to us all. And it was just like, Oh, this is like one of nine books he's written, like on environmental economics. So, okay, thank you. You know, and then I've got to present things to like argue to him. I'm like, yeah, fat chance, dude. I don't know anything, and you know everything. So <laughs> it was unbelievable. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I my first exposure to Oxford was when I was a kid. Like an eighteen-year-old Rob Lowe did a movie called Oxford Blues. Yep, and uh, and it was so cool. The the scenery, the everything about it. Like I'd always wanted to go. I'd always wanted to go see it. So have you been over? I have not. Dude, absolutely go. So like you, you say that, right? Like Oxford blues, like that's what I, I was an Oxford blue because I was, a, so like you can play sports for the, the colleges. Right. And then they have like intramural, like you play and they have like a whole tournament and everything. It's sick. So like I played rugby for Keeble or soccer for Keeble and we'd play like another college but then I played lacrosse for all of Oxford, which then I was able to like make friends with a bunch of kids across the university and then be able to go to their colleges and check it out and stuff. But when you're in Oxford, like when you play for the actual university of Oxford, you're a blue. And so we had like specific bow ties, right. Or ties that we had to wear out when we went out. Um, and it would get us access to like, there's like this bar called Vinny's, which is like for blues only, like, and you would like super elitist, like, it's just so funny to think about. Like you go there, you pregame, you get what's called like the pinky drink. It's like five shots of gin and some pink concoction. And you just oh, wow. over yourself. Yeah. To like the club. But yeah, man, like it's, it's very elite. It's very old. It's very progressive though. Um, but also, yeah, it's, it's, it's an, it's just an incredible place, man. If it wasn't for Oxford, I wouldn't be like where I am right now because I was over there. I was also coaching CrossFit at the time. Uh, at the gym over there to be able to train for free and that's how I met the guy who was the uh Jim Peskett who is the you know European distributor for X Endurance that's how I became exposed to that brand and then eventually when I graduated college and when I finished Teach for America I did a couple years as a sales rep for them and that's how I met Jason Jason's one of the owners and the CEO of it and that is how when I left X Endurance I trained transitioned into my full-time agency job so without oxford there would be none of this which is kind of a crazy thing to like really think about how little decisions can you know change the course of your life well that is a that's a perfect segue into your job history yeah because you went on to get your master's in education and teaching and then um you became an eighth grade math teacher so i graduated and i did teach for america Okay. Uh, which is a two year program. So I was an eighth grade math teacher while getting my master's in education. So it was one of those things where, so when you're doing Teach for America, right, you're placed in a, you know, like kind of like a rougher area, which 
I was placed in Providence, Rhode Island, which definitely has some, some tougher spots, but for the most part, like I could have been placed in like random place, Oklahoma. And that would have been, I think just way worse, just being out in the middle of nowhere. Like Providence is incredible. I love Providence. I love the people there. I consider it home. So like I go back and visit it a couple times a year. Um, cause I'm in Arizona now, but yeah. So during your first year of future America, first you go and do like five weeks of crash course training in, um, I was at St. John. So in Queens, New York, but I was in Harlem at Harlem village Academy teaching summer school students. Um, so you're just learning on the fly teaching, you know, kids are awesome, but they also come from some tough backgrounds, man. So, you know, sometimes it hits the fan there and you got to deal with it. But, um, you know, went from there, you know, you got to pass all these teaching tests, which I passed every single one, except for the math one, which, you know, this doesn't make me sound like a good math teacher, but I did it literally took me five times to pass it because it was everything in math that I never learned because in reality, I kind of skated my way through math, um, until I had to really learn calculus two to graduate college. And that was like the only thing I knew. So worked my butt off, finally passed that. Side note, did great teaching eighth grade math, just in case anybody doesn't think I did pre-algebra, algebra expert now. But if you go above that, I do not know it. Um, now taught for two years and during the first year you have to get your certification to, to be a teacher. And so you're taking night classes that were housed through Rhode Island College. Um, during my first year of teaching anyways, like I have to do that. And then when you finish year one, they're pretty much like, okay, cool. You have your certification to teach. Well, if you want your master's degree from Rhode Island college, it's only three more classes and it's a couple thousand bucks. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get a master's degree. That's essentially free. So I just did it, finished it. Cool to have, but honestly, I forget sometimes that I have that, but I do keep my teaching certification up in case I ever wanted to go back. Um, which, I don't think it'll happen, but maybe as a retirement gig, who knows? Because it, it was, the students were by far like the most incredible thing about that experience. Like they're just awesome. And, you know, I see some now they're at like Ivy League schools or they're at Tufts or they're, you know, at a lower level school playing sports or maybe they, you know, went into a trade or something, but they're like just busting their tail and they're incredible human beings. And it's like, it's so cool. So to think that I was Mr. Marsh at one point is hilarious, but I have it on my, my like jump rope, Mr. Marsh, the handles. Nice. Yeah. So then you went from that to ski instructor or maybe at the same time. Ski instructor has been happening. That was since I was 12 years old. So from 12 to 22, I taught skiing and I had a little freestyle group that I, I taught them how to, you know, ski in the park. And I would teach like private lessons and everything. And I was certified in that. And, um, I probably could have, could have, could have gone very high up in like the certification process of that, which is like a kind of coveted thing, but it's just one of those things where it was like, it was a great job through high school and college and everything, but I had different, different ambitions. So I just like to ski to ski, you know, like I used to coach CrossFit while I was in Providence because it was a ton of fun. I love the community. I just want to be around it. And the gym was like excellent, um, at full range. But when I left there and moved to Arizona, I just didn't want to, I wanted to be able to just be a member and not have to worry about that. Cause I got enough stress and thoughts going on that in my day-to-day -day job, you know? Um, so I was a ski instructor all throughout. And then, um, I also worked at a kayak shop, a whitewater kayak shop. I was a retail guy. And so I was doing that in the summer when skiing wasn't happening and, then in night times I would go and I would wash dishes. And so, so there'd be days where I would like a Saturday morning in the summer, man, I'd be up at like 7 AM at the kayak shop. And then I would leave there at like 5 PM. I would rush over to the restaurant and I'd wash dishes from 5 30 to 1 30 in the morning. It was miserable. And I just realized at one point I'm like, man, I don't have to do this. Like, I don't, I, I don't have to wash dishes once a week for 50 bucks. Like I just do not need that, you know? So I was doing it twice a week and then she cut it down to me doing it all by myself for the entire restaurant and bar and kitchen. And the other kid would do it the other night and it was miserable, man. So yeah. I, and so I did that. Um, there's another, Oh yeah. And then I, I became a zipline guide too. I was a zipline guide in the summer. And I, uh, at the same company as the whitewater, they have like whitewater and zip lining. So I was a zip line guide for the summertime. And then I would be a ski instructor during the, uh, winter time. So yeah, it was a lot of different gigs, man. Yeah. And that doesn't even mention J crew or, uh, X endurance. 
You're right. I forgot about Jay. Sorry. Yeah. So I had an internship at J. Crew in Manhattan. Um, right before I went to Oxford. So it was after my junior year. I yeah, I was down uh doing um data analysis and allocation for for J. Crew in Manhattan. And that's where I realized I could not be in an office all day un unless it was my own doing, which I'm in an office a lot, but it's my own doing and I'm passionate about what I do. So I love it. Um, but if it was for somebody else sitting in spreadsheets, no, thank you. Could not do it. And that's why I, I chuckle because, you know, the, uh, my girlfriend, Becca is an auditor for Deloitte. And so she is in spreadsheets all day, every day. And she is like one of the hardest working people I know, but I am like, Yo, I don't know if you could pay me, if you pay me a million bucks a year, I don't know if I could do what you do, like literally. So yeah, that was, that's where I learned that and that I did not want to be in a big city uh, full time. I, I like open spaces too much. So yeah. And then I was an ex-endurance sales rep. So that's when I left Teach for America uh, in the summer times during Teach for America, because I had the summers off kind of, right? You People think like teachers have three months off, but in reality, they're like, a recovering for a couple of weeks, B prepping for the next year, C in their classroom, doing stuff, training, summer school, et cetera. But I would do ex endurance sales part-time while I was teaching. And then when I left, I went full-time for a couple of years um, because I was just obsessed with CrossFit. I want to be around it. Right. So, um, and then, and then towards the tail end of my time with ex endurance, that's when I started being part-time with Jason in lab and just learning and studying and growing and then eventually flipped the switch turned X endurance off and went full time with with lab so it's kind of weird I, I feel like I always kind of like as I'm as I'm leaving one career I pick up the next and there's a little overlap and then I keep going so but at this point this is this is the gig I don't I don't see myself doing anything else because I don't want to do anything else yeah as a response if I had to do spreadsheets all day I would poke my eyes out with a pen 100% um right. yeah I, I've done statistics for a while. I've done stuff like that. I, I like that because it, it has a result and you're you're running tests and you're doing all this stuff, but spreadsheets, forget it. You're working towards something. Like problem solving, I enjoy. Like if I liked math so much when I knew how to do it because it's like, I remember like in calculus too, like I would do like, I would do something where it would be like, this would be my thing. And it would, it would be like rows of simplifying and working. And then your answer would come down here. And it would be like a 30 minute process, but I like thoroughly enjoyed it because it's like a puzzle. But as soon as you make it so that it's like, I'm not solving anything for myself, I'm solving it for somebody else or like doing whatever. I'm like, Oh no. When yeah. it comes down to, did I put the decimal point in the wrong place? Then yeah. I've, I've lost my mind. Yeah, literally. Yeah. hundred percent. Who did you, what'd you do statistics for? The state of Florida. Oh dang dude. So there's probably some crazy statistics out there. Yeah, it was uh, injury and illness data on in workplace injuries oh my god florida itself dude florida man eats alligator or something like that so yeah well and you have like disney uh, oh. all the theme parks and stuff all the accidents that happen there oh wow wow that was probably a spreadsheet that i would never want to know existed so we didn't use spreadsheets it was all data we would it would all just be we had people input it into a database and then my job was just querying the database to get the numbers Oh, geez. Okay. All right. Well, that poor person that had to, you know, input yeah. all that, that is a, that is like a death sentence. So I found one more thing that was kind of a little blip on your, on your radar for, for work history. And it's actually that okay. you are part owner in a company. And as a former 500 plus pound man, it was called the dough cart. Uh Oh, did I lose you for a second, Cooper? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. You said the dough cart. Yeah. The dough cart. Yeah. As a former 500 plus pound man, the dough cart intrigued me. Yes. So yeah, dude, this, this is like, that's weird, man. I'm, I'm, you're making me feel older than I am. Cause I feel like there's a lot of different lives. I've lived. But, uh, yeah. So, you know, Jake Marconi. Yep. Okay. So Jake is like my best friend. Like that's like my brother. Um, and so, you know, Jake and I ran around Providence together for a few years, right. Training and I'd tow him along to X endurance things, et cetera. And one of our good buddies, uh, or two of our good friends, Paul and Lori, this married couple, Paul and Lori could tell they launched PB donuts. Right. And so like, if you know, 
obviously, obviously, you know, Nicole Brazier, like Nicole is a huge fan of him. Steph Chung's a huge fan of him. Like PB donuts, right. Are they're like this, there's a staple thing. There's a, there's a few donut places in Rhode Island. Alley's being one of the first ones, but PB donuts is like internationally known. Like Paul and Lori absolutely crush it. And we were like, you know what? We need a mobile contingent to this. So we went out and we started the dough cart, Paul, Jake, and I, but Jake and I would actually like run it. Paul was just more of like, he, he provided us um, marketing services and, and a kitchen and everything to use. But yeah, so we would, we would tow a, we would tow, you know, the dough cart around to like colleges, man. And we would, we would sell donuts to like drunk kids and like just make money. And it was fun. We just had a ton of fun, dude. And there's an incredible story if you want it about our first event ever. If you want me to tell it, it's yeah, awesome. Please, please. So we get the dough cart, right? We're getting it wrapped. It's not even finished being wrapped, but we get it wrapped. And honestly, this is, if Molly ever somehow listens to this, I'm sorry, Molly, because I've never told anybody this, but now you'll know. You, she doesn't even know. Um, so, you know, Jake, Jake, 2018, Jake, right? He tore it up, took like 19 in the world, qualified like third for regionals. He's a young, young kid at the time out of the East. Um, and so, you know, he needed PT work, right? And so Molly, who is an awesome PT out of Rhode Island, she would, she would do his PT work for free. And so the way that we were going to pay her back is we were going to go up and we were going to do her and her wife's wedding in Vermont and, um, you know, bring the truck up. So, you know, our boy, Mike Tasca, who like owns a car, you know, dealership, he, he gives us a truck. We tow it up four hours up in Vermont. We get up there where it's stow. We, you know, we set the, we set the thing up. We prop the window up, looking out at the green mountains. We're so fired up. It's our first time doing it. We, we pull the robot out. Right. And I get the generator that we just bought for like 900 bucks or whatever. And I go to get the cable that Paul was supposed to buy to plug into the generator and it is not the right thing. Like the, the male uh, side of the output is for like a washing machine. And it's just like, first off, I'm like, Paul, you SOB, like you effed us. And then also I'm like, it's Sunday. It's a Sunday wedding. I'm like, there is nothing open. So we call these places that we, we call like a few different, we call a few different um, like hardware stores locally. And they're like, yeah, no, we don't nobody makes an extension cord for that. Like you have like a Frankenstein of a machine. I'm like, Oh my, we're so screwed. And it's like, dude, there's nothing we can do. I look all around the kitchen inside the building. There's nobody has that outlet. So we can't turn our robot on. So we can't make donuts. And I'm like, man, this is the only thing we have to pay this woman back. Like if we just all of a sudden, like, this is the dessert for her wedding. We can't, we cannot show up empty handed, you know, like, and this is, you know, Jake's sitting there in the car, and then I just remember, I'm like, wait a minute. And I Google up, I just Google donuts and, you know, like a Murphy's donuts pops up and I'm like, yo, Jake, it's 15 minutes away. They close in 20 minutes. And I was like, let's go buy all of their donuts. And he was like, deal. And so we literally, we, we call them and I'm like, how many donuts do you have? And they're like 150. It was like some like a little middle school girl. Like how much would it cost to buy them all? She was like, excuse me. I'm like, I want to buy all of the donuts. How much? And she was like, uh, like $75. I was like, perfect. Pull them. And so we, we've ripped down there. I swear to God, it's like the biggest thing that's ever happened in, in this town's history, because like people come over to like, watch us buy all these donuts. Like the first time this place probably ever sold out. And, uh, they write like a, I remember there's like a note. So like, congratulations on the wedding. So they probably thought Jake and I were getting married, which is fine. If, you know, if you're like a married couple to begin with. Um, they spelled congratulations wrong, which is hilarious. They threw a D in there. Um, like congratulations. Um, and we, so we buy all of those donuts and then we pick through them. We're like, all right, we don't make like anything that's like long like this. Like we only make cake, cake donuts. So like F it threw those out, like, you know, tore through and probably ate a few. We saw a Dunkin' Donuts. I was like, screw it. Stop in there. We bought all their cake donuts, drove back to the cart. And I'm like, we're going to we're going to redip all of these. We're going to put sprinkles on them. They're coming us. And we literally like tore through them all threw them in a dumpster where nobody could ever see them and came in with the donuts. And we're like, ta-da, we made them here they are. And they were thrilled. They were like, these donuts are so good. And I was like, and the thing is, man, like none of those donuts touched our, tr like our real donuts. Like our, our donuts were way better, but um, we made it happen. They were stoked. And then Jake and I, we drank and, and dance. We were like, we were stressed.
<laughs> and you never told them? No, I never told them. <laughs> Till so, now? I guess so. So Molly, if you hear this, I'm sorry. I hope your wedding was fun. <laughs> but yeah, it was awesome, dude. And then and then like they came they came to a brewery we did. Uh, a couple weeks later and they're like wow these donuts are incredible like you guys are improving so much because at that point we had it figured out we were like thanks man like yeah you know we're just working hard so hey oh it's this... it's a testament to the fact that there's always a solution to the problem you just have to think hard enough oh this podcast is worth that story alone good i'm glad so yeah, yeah. dude awesome phoebe donuts the dough cart no. Well, Cooper, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, I had a blast. Um, we'll have to do this again sometime, man. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise, this was fun. This was very, very easy. You're, you're easy to converse with. So if you're somebody who's listening to this, make sure you subscribe and keep supporting Scott. Awesome. So. Thanks, Cooper. Thanks, dude. Appreciate you, man. Oh!